Hi, my name is Lauren Templeton, and you are listening to Investing the Templeton Way. This podcast is for anyone interested in learning more about investing. In this podcast, I will be interviewing some of the greatest minds from the investment community and exploring topics ranging from international markets to behavioral finance. To learn more, please visit us at investingthetempletonway.com. The information presented in this podcast or available on the website is not intended as and shall not be construed as financial advice. This podcast is produced for entertainment value. Investing is inherently risky, and I encourage you to seek financial advice from a professional who is aware of the facts and circumstances of your individual situation. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Investing the Templeton Way podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton. And I'm your co-host, Scott Phillips. And I am really thrilled to introduce today's guest, William Green, who is the acclaimed author of the best-selling book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, How the World's Greatest Investors Win in Markets and Life. In his book, William delves into the lives and philosophies of some of the most successful investors, including my great uncle, John Templeton, and thinkers of our time, providing a wealth of insights and wisdom on how to achieve lasting success and happiness. William's work has been praised by many as groundbreaking and an inspiring guide to living a more fulfilling life. Whether you're an entrepreneur an investor, or simply someone seeking to live a more meaningful life, you won't want to miss this episode. So join us today as we explore the secrets to a richer, wiser, and happier life. And let's get started with this interview with William. Welcome, William. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. The last time I saw you was in Switzerland, so it's it's great to see you back on home turf again. Yes, that was a wonderful conference. William is referencing a conference put on by the value investor named Guy Spear. It's called Value X. And many of us just made the trip to Switzerland to participate in the conference. It was a really special event that Scott and I both enjoyed. How many years have you been attending Value X? You know, the last time I went was when I was helping Guy with his book, The Educational Value Investor. So I think that was back in about 2015. And so I don't think I made it much to the conference. I, I think he, he, he rented a very nice uh, hotel suite for me. And I sat there kind of beating my head against the keyboard. And, and uh, you, you've written books, so you know how intense it is. But that, uh, that experience of working on Guy's book with him was particularly intense because we were kind of rewriting it in about three months. He already had a manuscript except for the last couple of chapters. And, and then I came in and was like, no, you've got to overhaul this whole thing. So, oh, so it no. was a mad, mad rush, but but very memorably fun. So this this visit to Switzerland was a little calmer than that one. Yeah, I'm sure you enjoyed yourself a little more with this visit. Well, I <laughs> yeah. think I provided a blurb for the back of Guy's book. So I also was one of the early readers of that manuscript. That's right. And, you know, I was with him, actually, when you sent that blurb. And, <laughs> and so I was with him in Switzerland. I, okay. So I remember his delight at the fact that you had sent it. So so thank you. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's jump into your book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. In this book, you examine the lives and investment philosophies of some of the world's greatest investors. Can you tell us about your experience in researching and writing this book and why? what inspired you to do this? Well, I'd been researching and writing about great investors for many years, really since my, I guess, mid-20s, and I'm now 54. So this goes back a long way. And and so initially, I got really interested in these people just because I was kind of lazy and subversive and thought, this is the most amazing thing. If you can make money with money as an investor, what, what a fantastic gift that is, instead of having to do really hard work. And then I started to interview more and more of the great investors and I just realized what fascinating characters they were and also what extraordinary thinkers they were. And, and so, so that kind of deepened, deepened my fascination with what you could learn really not only about how to get rich and become financially independent and secure, but actually about how you could deal with questions like the fact that the future is unknowable and yet we have to make decisions about the future. And is there anything that you can do to stack the odds in your favor so that you're more likely to succeed 
despite the fact that the future is unknowable and that none of us really has full control over what's going to happen. And, and actually, one of the first great experiences that I had that really launched my fascination was going to see your great uncle in, in the Bahamas, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm delighted to talk about in more detail. But I mean, yeah. he, he was such a riveting character. And that was one of, one of the times where I thought, God, this is, this is more than about getting rich. Here's a guy who's obsessed with increasing the spiritual wealth of mankind. And he's totally independent minded and absolutely fearless about being judged and uh, you know, has all of these sort of really strong opinions about things like uh, his idea that, you know, you should never really retire, that he said, you know, people are, uh -huh. uh, you know, useless people doing nothing with their retirement. So he, so you weren't just learning about investing from him, you were actually getting this, this kind of genius talking to you about every area of life, like how to, how to think better, what to do with your money, how to control your mind and your thoughts. And that was an early example, I think, of when I started to realize, oh, this is not just a game about getting rich so that I don't have to work hard and and report to a boss I dislike. This is actually a whole way of thinking ab about the world. So think of something like what he said to me, where he simply said, um, when I was asking him for advice about investing, stay away from your own ignorance, stay away from your own emotion. Just just as, as we're going through a tumultuous period in the markets at the moment where lots of people are freaked out, just those simple reminders that you don't want to do things that you're ignorant about. And so a lot of a lot of the trouble that people are going through at the moment is that they made bets on things that they were ignorant about, that they didn't really fully understand. And so if you took seriously warnings like that from Sir John, it it helped you as an investor, but it's also a reminder in other areas of life to stay away from your ignorance. You know, why should I be why should I be arrogant enough to believe that I understand other things without actually doing the work? So yeah. it sort of radiates out in every area once you actually start to look at these lives and think about what you can learn from them. Yeah. So I am so curious about that interview because, you know, you read stuff about your family members and in, in different books. And there's so much of his personality, as you described it, that I agree with. I mean, I started working with him when I was 24 years old. And the intensity of his personality, which comes across very well in your chapter, The Willingness to be Lonely, in your book, it, it, is, it was intense for me to meet uh. with him. I have not yet, I have yet to meet a single person that doesn't describe the the experience of meeting with John Templeton as very intense, very intimidating. Um, the, even these legendary investors were almost scared when they met with him. Do you agree with that, Scott? That's sort of the feedback we've gotten. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, he, he, you described it as an austerity, uh, William, and I agree with that. He was so he had so much focus and self-control in everything he did. And I think that, of course, he was extremely warm and, and polite and friendly. And if you pulled him out of the business or investing context, he was just completely you know, disarming and, and delightful. But when you stepped into that arena, kind of his space, so to speak, he, he commanded the room. And he didn't have to say anything. And you knew what he was thinking. And you were on the spot. And you knew that you had about two minutes to convince him that you belonged in that room with him. And that was it. And it was always a lot of pressure. And yeah, I think I, everyone I, around him felt that in the business context when you're talking about investing. Because he just knew so much that if you didn't have something interesting or novel, he was moving on very quickly. Yeah, and he, he clearly was smarter than the rest of us as well, right? I mean, he had a fearsome intellect. So, I, I mean, you, you guys, uh, you know, knew him way better, th better than I did. But the fact that he came to his class at, at Yale while having to support himself and pay his way th through Yale, then gets a Rhodes Scholarship. There was something. So, so it, it starts, I think, with the fact that he had this fearsomely powerful engine. But then the, I mean, there were things, things that you wrote about in your books about him. Um, that I talked to him about as well, that gave him a competitive advantage, like going off on that trip to, what was it, something like 37 countries at a time when most Americans 
stayed home and didn't have passports. So think about that informational advantage that you get from the fact that, so it's not only that he had raw brain power that was better than most of us, almost all of us. He was giving himself an informational edge by traveling more, by going to these places. He was going to markets that most people really didn't pay attention to. So, so less efficient markets. He was, he was taking principles like buying stuff cheap, buying at the point of maximum pessimism, buying what other people didn't like and what they were afraid to own and were selling. But he was also doing it in places that nobody else was looking. And so th there, I think there are timeless principles there that are immensely helpful. But then when you look at a period like we're going through at the moment where the markets are pretty tumultuous, you can also see the advantage that someone like Sir John had that he... He had fierce conviction, fierce confidence in his own judgment. Whereas I think for most of us, if we don't have the actual knowledge of how to, how to value companies, for example, how to, how to actually tether ourselves to valuation, you're, you're, kind of, you're, you're just being sort of swept around in the ocean by all of these waves without anything really to, to tether you to some kind of rational analysis where you look at, I mean, for, for you guys, this is so obvious because you can do this. But for most investors, at a moment like this, we're just feeling kind of windswept and there's nothing to tether you to, to reality, to say, well, the market is being irrational right now and there are all of these bargains as a result and I can judge it based on, you know, these metrics. And so I think part of it, when, when he talked to me about staying away from your own ignorance and staying away from your own emotion, was just a really good reminder to be humble, to, to understand whether you're equipped to win the game. And then he said something else to me that I, I, I think about so often, I can't even tell you. Where he said, you, you shouldn't be arrogant enough to believe that you can pick the one fund, the one fund manager, the one asset class, the one country... Uh, the one stock. And I, I've thought about that so many times over the last 20 or so years, because every time I would get carried away by something and I think, uh, this is so cheap, I should put lots of money in this, or this is so attractive, I should put lots of money in this. I would kind of remember Sir John saying, well, no, a regular investor should own five or six mutual funds that give them exposure to different parts of the market. And it was just a reminder not to get carried away, to understand that you can be wrong, to understand that the world is an uncertain place. And if you carry, if you, if you extrapolate from what he was saying, even the idea of just having all of your money in one bank or one brokerage firm, that seems to me overly risky. And we've kind of seen that borne out in the last couple of weeks with S Silicon Valley Bank going under. And so I, I think what's amazing is that this guy who had no no access to things like the teachings of Ben Graham or anything like that. I mean, he was inventing the rules as he went along because he was so early at this game of international investing uh, that he figured all of this stuff out himself. And yet the principles are so unbelievably robust that here we are years after he's passed away and we can still be guided by those timeless principles. Yeah, it really is amazing. And I appreciated in, in the chapter on your book that you walked away from your interview with him and you did not have a favorable impression of him. But many years later, have had time to reflect on Sir John as a person and what he was trying to accomplish. And now you understand it in more of a fulsome way and have greater appreciation for it. Let me say that one of the um, interesting, personally, one of the points that I got out of your book, and it's always been, uh, I, f I feel like, very interesting. So Uncle John, you know, like he said, that he believes in a useful life. You should be useful. You don't need to experience joy. So he, you know, was a, he was very serious, and he wanted to be useful and purposeful. My grandfather, his brother, also went to Yale University before Sir John did. And Uncle John would always say, you know, your grandfather is the smarter of the two. And I think most people in our family think that is the case. But my grandfather had a completely different take on life. And he had five children. 
He was an inventor. He liked to tinker with things. He invented something, a mispropagation system for plants. He sold his business by running an advertisement in the paper, in the Tennessee newspaper, which said, I already have all the money I need. And then he printed the financials of his business in the newspaper. And he said, so I'd like to sell my business to somebody because he already had all the money he needed. Mm. And, and so they just had a completely different life philosophy. He went on to become, my grandfather had become on a race, a race car driver, mm. and he built his own race cars. And he had a great time doing it. It was very well respected in the race car industry. He built, he raced Formula Vs and Formula Fords. But I would go down to visit Uncle John, and he would say, your grandfather just has wasted his life. It's a total waste to have that much talent and to have wasted his life. You know, just huge disappointment. And so I saw that and then what he thought of my grandfather. And on the other side, I saw my grandfather who had this very rich life mm. full of deep relationships. His children were all successful. They're all friends, wonderful family gatherings. He did exactly what he wanted to do. He read a book a day. He did stuff to challenge his mind. I mean, it just was very interesting to me. And I think you pick up on that in the book, how driven Uncle yeah. John was. That's the deep insight that both men were very deliberate and purposeful, but they had different takes on how to apply it. Yeah, I think that's a really important insight that, that in, in some ways the real challenge is to know yourself well enough that you say what really constitutes a truly rich and successful an abundant life to me. And for one person, that's really going to be heavy on peace of mind, calmness, relationships, being out in nature, relishing nature. For another person, that's going to look like a waste of time. It's going to be like, well, wait, what did you actually achieve today? And, and so I think when I look at the ultra successful, like the, the extraordinarily successful people that I've interviewed over the years, there's a deep alignment with their inner nature. It's, and, and they're often profoundly idiosyncratic, pretty strange people. And so I think, I think somehow you have to live a life that's aligned with your own craziness and idiosyncrasy in order to be astonishingly successful. But I think that also comes with risks. You know, there, there was a moment where Monish Pabrai uh, had, w was um, visiting Charlie Munger and he sent me a lovely video where he said to Charlie, you know, how do you like William's book? And Charlie said something very kind about the book. And Monish said, you know, and do you have any particular insights, things that you found very striking about it? And Charlie said, yeah, how many of us divorced? And I thought that was a really interesting insight that he said, you know, one of the things it, he said, Charlie said, it kind of makes sense because it's such an all consuming game. It's so captivating that you often end up neglecting your partner or your spouse. And so I think one of the things that you have to decide is, you know, what am I optimizing for? Am I optimizing for impact on society? Am I optimizing for fame, power, money, reputation? Am I optimizing for my kids to be happy and balanced and decent human beings? And these aren't really value judgments. It's not, it's not like, it's not like one is necessarily right. But when I look at the people I admire most in the investment world, on the whole, there's a little bit more balance. There's something that they're fiercely driven, but at the same time, they've managed to do it without causing mayhem around them and destroying the lives of their kids and their spouses. And I, I remember Charlie once saying to me, you know, he would he would talk about people like Sumner Redstone, right? And I, I never met Sumner Redstone. I, I hear there's a new biography of him that's supposed to be really, really interesting. And so this was an immensely successful tycoon, multi-billionaire, who was, I think, at Harvard Law School a year or so before um, Munga. So they, they so sim similar age cohort and similarly successful. And Charlie said, actually, he was more successful than me in terms of money. But he said, even his wives and kids hated him. And, you know, I think he, he spent the last few years of his, of his life in a lawsuit against his daughter. And, 
I mean, it's an, it's an amazing thing. So is that a successful life? And so what Charlie said is all my life, I've been saying to myself, you know, Sumner Redstone is the example of what I don't want to be. And so I think when you're trying to figure out what to learn from the greatest investors, you, yes, you want to clone to, to use Monish's term. You want to look at what they figured out and say, well, let me take the best of what they figured out. But then you want to adapt it to your own circumstances and personality and values. And so for me, when I look at Sir John saying to someone, you know, I'll, I'll meet you at 4.13 p.m. because I've got another meeting at 4.17 p.m., I, I don't know. It worked for him. And sure, he was infinitely more productive than I am by a factor of, you know, a million. On the other hand, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know if you want to live in such an austere severe way where every minute is accounted for. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if he wanted to live that way. I mean, just personally, I think that there was a big change in his life when his first wife passed away very tragically and he was left with three young children. And, you know, my guess is that he had to focus on something. Yeah. And that work became his lifeline. And my impression is that his life and his personality was very different prior to the accident. For those of you who don't know, he famously saved up for their first family vacation and gave his wife a trip to Bermuda for Christmas. And she was on a moped and going around a curve and there was a piece of lumber hanging off the back of a truck and it hit her in the head and she died in Bermuda. And his children were quite small. I think he was very, very heartbroken. It was the love of his life. And my guess is this was more of a survival mechanism for him that developed out of those years post her death. Um, I don't know if you have an opinion on that. I felt the same way that when I, when I first met him all of those years ago, what what is it, you know, 23, 24 years ago, Uh I was very put off by the severity and the austerity, the, the control that he had over his emotions, his time, his money, his thoughts, every aspect of his life. And then when I started writing the chapter as a middle-aged man, looking back on the difficulties of my own life or the difficulties that all of us go through, I, I was thinking about the emphasis that he had on taking control of his inner landscape, of his thoughts. And I was just thinking, well, of course. Why, how, could, how could you have survived the loss of your spouse? Mm-hmm. And the fact that you were left to bring up three young kids on your own, if you hadn't got control of of your mind. And I, I, I loved a, a quote that you had that you quoted to me again when we were in Switzerland. It was in one of one of your writings about him, where you talked about how he would deal with with negative thoughts when they came and how he would sort of banish them to the nowhere from where they became. And I. I think when I was younger, because I, you know, I studied English literature at Oxford, right? So I came out as a, as a very creative, writerly type, interested in literature, interested in books, which is really all about kind of the, the peculiarities of people's personalities. And I was sort of fascinated by people's errant behavior, the ways in which they screw up their lives and do stupid things and are out of control. And so my paradigm for how one was to live life was very different. I was looking at things and thinking, well, part of a rich life is having intense emotion, dealing with chaos, having relationships that mess up. You know, there's a, there's a great Buddhist teacher called, um, called Jack Cornfield who uses the beautiful term full catastrophe living. And so I was interested in full catastrophe living. And then when I look back decades later, I think, no, I actually want to get control of my thoughts and my emotions and my time. And and so in, with maturity, I think I had much greater, not only respect, but actually admiration for the fact that he had, he had tamed his mind to, and his time to such a degree. And so I wouldn't want to be as severe and austere in my treatment of myself or others. I think we need more self-compassion. Uh, more compassion for others. But at the same time, I think he points, he points us towards a very, very deep secret of life, which, which like all secrets probably is fairly mundane, which is that you need to master your inner landscape. And that if you want to have a successful life, 
it's an inside job. It's not going to just be about your money. It's going to be about your peace of mind, your relationships, doing fulfilling work, having purpose, stuff like that. It's much more, it's much more nebulous. It's not so, so tangible, um, but it's all inside your head. That's where really much of what we're doing is happening. And I, so, so in a way, what I was doing in writing that chapter was fighting with Sir John 20 something years later with my memory of him and thinking, well, what did I miss? What did I fail to understand that I need to understand now? And so in a way, it's an argument with Sir John. It's an argument with my earlier self. And then there's the, then there's the ironic thing that, you know, I was also very prejudiced because I was a young agnostic or possibly atheistic journalist, very skeptical of everything, very sort of intellectual and cerebral and argumentative. And here I come meet this guy who's proselytizing about, you know, religion and spirituality. And I was just very close minded about it. And the joke is that over probably the last 15 years, I've become increasingly spiritual minded. And I often think Sir John is up there in the upper world sort of laughing <laughs> Riley yeah. at the fact that I end up, you know, doing a lot of the things that that uh, he would have suggested that I do, uh, and I'm, I, you know, I'm still sort of profoundly flawed in all of these terrible ways. But at, at least I'm sort of, I, I mean, now oddly, I do believe in things like prayer and stuff. And when uh-huh. he talked all those years ago about, you know, the power of prayer and wanting to wanting to study it at Harvard and bankrolling research where you would see whether the prayer worked and he would say, you know, and does it work? Does healing work better if you put your hands on the person or if, uh, if it's remote or if they say, uh, thy will be done or, you know, and I would just sort of roll my eyes at this. And now I look at it and I'm like, yeah, what, what do I know? And, and I think, I think it's a very powerful reminder that we should just be more humble. We should just, be aware that we have these very limited perspectives, this okay. bias, these filters through which we put everything. And what do I know? And I was thinking, I, remind me of the, the motto of the Templeton Foundation, right? Of, you know, basically how little we know, right? How little we know, how eager to learn. I mean, our main giving area is called humility and theology. But William, I would say, you know, my grandfather, his brother was an atheist. He would not have... Huh. Um, minded having that discussion or judged you for that he was always questioning things and to put in context i was just reading with the templeton foundation the other day a memo on the unity church which was a movement that started in around 1880 and really spread across the world the unity churches and it's all about my understanding after reading this memo which was very brief so i'm not an expert here it's on thought control yeah managing your thoughts so I think there was some historical context too and there's a good book on that that I read as part of my research because I I have this tendency to fall down rabbit holes which is the the other side of not having much discipline over my time and my thoughts is that I fall down these intellectual rabbit holes where I'm like well I wonder where that came from his idea of you know who were these people who he was quoting Mm-hmm. in his books about worldwide principles. And so I would actually go off and I would read those books. So none of this really gets into my chapter. But, you know, I went off and, and read stuff about those teachers from from that church. And yeah, it's very much about how you gain control over your thought thoughts, how how your consciousness shapes your reality. And for me, a lot of what I've studied over the last 15 years as my life became increasingly focus on spiritual stuff has been Kabbalah, which is this ancient form of mysticism, which really is so much about the power of your consciousness. You know, I had a a great teacher called Rav Berg who would just say over and over again, everything is consciousness. Consciousness is everything. Like that was sort of the great teaching of his life. And then you look at things like Tibetan Buddhism that I study a lot as well. And again, it's how, how do you, how do you tame the mind? And so this is really fascinating to me when you start to see a multiple different spiritual and philosophical paths, the same kind of things coming up. And so you look at you look at the Stoics and you start you start reading Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus or Seneca. And again, it was all about how do you gain control over your mind? And so 
So one of the things that that Bill Miller, who's one of the great investors who who I interviewed for the book and have interviewed many times over the last 22, 23 years, one of the, he was the guy who got me originally to start reading Stoic philosophy, something like 20 years ago. And one of the reasons is that it gives you a way to deal with adversity so that when things are not going your way, whether it's the market or your kids or your... Um, uh, your health or whatever it might be, you're able to focus on what you can control, which is the inner landscape. And And there's an extraordinary book that Bill Miller got me to read once called Thoughts of a Philosophical Fighter Pilot that's by, I think, Vice Admiral Stockdale, who talked about being shot down over Vietnam and then being basically tortured over a seven-year period in the Hanoi Hilton. And he was obsessed with Epictetus and the Stoics. And he would go into these sessions where he was going to be tortured and he would just say over and over again mantras like no fear, no shame, because he knew that he was going to get tortured to a point where he was going to crack and he was going to rat out other people because there was just nothing he could do. And so dealing with the shame was a very important aspect of of kind of keeping his inner sense of, of honor and integrity because he... And so he refused to to take when when they offered him the opportunity to go home early because he was very senior. He refused to go home because it was a way of regaining his sense of honor and integrity. And so I think that's really interesting and revealing when you see the Kabbalists, the Stoics, the Buddhists and and the movement within the Christian church that, that Sir John came from, all studying how to gain control over your thoughts and your consciousness and so I think I was, I was just too naive as a young person going to interview him to know how important this was. I just thought, well, my mind is all over the place. I'm a creative literary type. That, that's just who I am. I have these very high ups and very low downs. And, um, you know, because I feel things intensely, that's precisely what entails me, uh, what enables me to interview people understand their emotions and, and write in a way that's empathetic. And increasingly, as I've grown older, I think, no, no, no. You're given these tools in all of these different paths that enable you to tame your mind, to gain control over your mind. And if you want to have a successful and happy and abundant life, you better familiarize yourself with this stuff. Because otherwise, who's, who's running the show? And it's really relevant for investors because you think of a time like this where you're going through lots of turmoil right now in the markets, but also over the last year or so. If you don't have your emotions under some degree of control, how can you make rational decisions? Yeah, it reminds me of some of your discussion on Howard Marks in your book and the concept, and I'm not going to say this correctly, so you say it for me. It's a Japanese phrase, mono yeah, no aware. Yeah, mu mujo. Mujo. Yeah, it no comes, I think the original term is shogyo mujo, which basically means everything is changing. And, and so yeah. there was a great, a great Zen Buddhist teacher who um, I think it was called Shunryo Suzuki. He wrote an amazing book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. A very interesting book where he talks about this, this essential Buddhist teaching that everything is changing. Nothing is permanent. And so if you live in a world where everything is changing and nothing is impermanent and you're rocked by that, you're in deep trouble as an investor and as a human. So, so one of the things that Howard figured out, Howard Marks figured out is, okay, so I have, to, I have to see reality as it is, which is I live in a world where everything is changing. And if I, if I act as if it's not changing, I'm going to be in deep trouble. And so, so if you think about a period like that, that that period we went through a year and a half, two years ago, where all of those tech stocks and SaaS stocks were, were soaring, the Zooms, the Pelotons, the Rokus, the Netflixes, the Spotify's, the, the areas you really wanted to be in. If you, if, except that they were priced at an intolerably high valuation, but if the the people who did really well back then were the ones who were throwing caution to the wind and were like, no, no, I'll own these, I'll buy Snowflake at 150 times revenues. And if you don't understand that everything always changes, that everything is impermanent, you're liable to get caught up in 
in recency bias, assuming that the next period is going to be the same as the current period or the one you've just gone through. And so I think Howard's very essential truth here, his very essential insight is you need to recognize that life is more like a pendulum, that markets are more like a pendulum, that they swing between fear and greed, you know, complacency it, during moments of complacency where it seems like risk is lower. Actually, the risk is heightened because everyone everyone is is operating as if it's always going to be like that. And and Sir John clearly understood this yeah. better than anyone, right? I mean, the fact that during World War Two he was able to make this extraordinary bet at the point of maximum pessimism, saying, you know, well, the world is not coming to an end. And likewise, in 2008, 2009, Howard said the same thing. He said, most of the time, the world doesn't end. And so that simple recognition that everything changes, and so the time that's, that's great, where everything seems fine, is not going to last. But nor is the time that's terrible. So when you're in the midst of a pandemic, and you're all stuck at home, and you're scared for your relatives, you're scared for yourself, you're scared for your business. If you can survive it, if you can stay in the game, everything is going to change again, and the pendulum is going to swing again. So a big part of a successful life and a successful career as an investor is just surviving and staying in the game so that you don't get knocked out during those periods of catastrophe. That's right. My dad has a cross stitch on his desk and a frame that says nothing is stable in human affairs. Therefore, avoid undue elation and prosperity and undue depression and adversity. That's um, great. And it's a Socrates quote. But One of the things that occurred to me when you were talking, William, is I think this was the case for Sir John and, and other successful investors. You not only accept the uncertainty, but you learn to take advantage of it. So mm. you look forward to it. You anticipate it. You crave it because that's your opportunity. If you think that your advantage of, as an investor, as Sir John would have said, his was his judgment, it's behavioral. Yeah. And so if you know these things are coming, you not only embrace them. And, that, and that's why, you know, someone in, in the family asked him why he saved 50 percent of his, of his earnings every year. He said to be ready for the next opportunity. Yeah. And so once you get in that mindset, you really, it just reframes the whole game, all the dynamics. And uh, I think that's what these people tap into. That, that's, you know, what we try to do as investors as well. It's very powerful when you can see it that way. It, it requires you to be extraordinarily independent-minded in your thinking. It requires you to have the, the analytical skills that you can actually look at the underlying reality and say, well, based on these valuations, I can't buy zoom and peloton and spotify and roku and snowflake even though i'd like to and even though the people who throw in caution to the wind look incredibly smart because they've made so much money and i haven't so so it requires skills it requires intellect it requires independence of mind and it requires some degree of emotional fortitude because the the pain of it is that just just as maynard keynes john maynard keynes said you know the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent you can you can be totally rational and get punished for it for year after year after year after year while the mugs and idiots are making an absolute fortune you know betting on obscure cryptocurrencies in their ftx account and um and so it's very painful and so this is i i, I love the phrase that monish pabra used with me where he talked about the importance of the ability to take pain. And I think that's true. And I, I, I don't really, as, a, as an observer of the great investors, I'm not really observing them in terms of the, the, the accounting and the analysis of balance sheets and stuff. I'm, I'm looking at them as human beings, much as I would if I'd become a novelist, which is what I originally thought I was going to do after I left university and, and then went to Columbia Journalism School. And so I look at what they go through emotionally. And I see the pain. I mean, I, I, it's very, very intense. And there, I mean, this last period, I, I have friends who, you know, were out of favor for 10, 12 years. That's mm -hmm. brutal. If you're, if you're a traditional, um, very smart, prudent, skeptical, wary, rational investor who wasn't going to get carried away, by the good times, you looked foolish for about 12 years. That's excruciating. 
And, and part of what happens, it goes back to something that Jean-Marie Eveillard said to me many years ago, where he said, you know, look, the, I, I'll probably gobble his quote, but he basically said, you know, when you underperform massively, he said the, the first year your shareholders are upset, the second year they're really angry, and the third year they're gone. And so I think that's part of the problem is actually, even, even if you have these qualities like independence of mind, analytical skill, and emotional equanimity, you still may lose all of your customers. Absolutely. Yeah. Tom Russo calls it the capacity to suffer. Yeah. So if you want yeah. to be a good value investor, you need the capacity to suffer. I love value investing because it just gives you confidence and a framework behind you. It helps you stay pat. We call it building a psychological uh, fortress around you. Uh, value investing allows for you to do that. But yeah. it's probably easier if you're managing your own money or you, you've oh, managed yeah. to educate your clients so that your clients That's truly important. understand it and have internalized it. But it's very, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I, and, you know, I spent so much time with Guy Spear, who we were talking about uh, b- before, and I, I've seen him at the most painful moments. And I, I have an episode of my podcast, The Richer Wiser Happier Podcast, coming out tonight that, where, where we talk about this. We talk about going back to times like 2008, 2009, in two, early 2016 when he was getting really hit and I I saw up close the misery and so here's a guy who's incredibly smart and you know came to office class in economics at Oxford went to Harvard Business School has gone 25 years running I think to Omaha for the Birch Hathaway annual meeting so he's deeply internalized these principles and yet he still feels the pain and emotion and he still feels the, the blow of when he's underperformed or he's had a stock blow up or some terrible mistake. He feels the sense of, of pain that I think comes partly from the fact that he has friends and family like me invested in the fund. And mm-hmm. um, I, I think that human element is something that it's, I think regular people underestimate the degree of pressure that you guys are under and just yeah. just how painful it can be. And one, one of the things that I said to friends of mine who are well-known investors at times where they're getting really clobbered and are absolutely miserable, when I see them in a state of absolute misery, I try to remind them that usually that's a prelude to things turning around, that when they're at, when they're at that point of maximum pain, that's usually a pretty good sign that it's going to turn around. But it's it's a fascinating thing because most people, I think, regular people look at look at rich money managers and they're like, "Ha, oh, they got it made, and it's so easy." And they just, it's like, no, it's it's really painful. And it, it reminds me, there's a lovely line from the um, from this singer Neil Young who says, "My problems are so meaningless, but that don't make them go away." And so it's like, yeah, cry me a river for the the rich investor who's you know who's under all of this pressure, but it's. But it's real. And that, that was one of the things I was trying to write about in the epilogue of my book when I was writing about people like um, Bill Miller getting absolutely clobbered during the financial crisis. I was trying to give a sense that one of the lessons of that story of Bill going through tremendous pain and suffering during the financial crisis, when 100 people lost their jobs because of a mistake that he made and investors lost a lot of money and he got pilloried in, in the news media, one of the lessons is a, the, a fundamental Buddhist truth, which is everyone suffers. And that's a really helpful thing to remember because, A, it makes you more empathetic. It makes you look at other people and say, just because this person is rich and successful or cleverer than me or uh, better at sport or has more friends or whatever it might be, you look at them and you're like, no, everyone suffers. And that's a really important fundamental insight in life because then then you start to look at people that you resent or that you're jealous of or whatever, and you, or that are going through a tough time. And you're just like, no, they, they have their own burden to carry and I need to be a little more empathetic to them. And the other thing is, it teaches you that you better prepare for these times when it's your turn in the, in the barrel, as Tom Gaynor's father used to say to him, you know, everyone has their turn in the barrel. And so part of a successful life and a successful investment career is to prepare in advance for the times of difficulty. And one of the things that you have to do is actually have rich relationships. Because if when you're in the barrel, you don't have a good 
relationship with your wife or husband or boyfriend or girlfriend or kids or best friends or whatever, it's a much more painful experience going through it alone. And so, so relationships are key. Things like meditation and exercise and nutrition are key because, you know, if you're, if you're feeling terrible about yourself and you have no control over your thoughts, very hard to deal with adversity. And my friend Ken Schubenstein, who's a former hedge fund manager and venture capitalist who's given up the investment world and become a neurologist, so he's an expert on the, the brain, said to me a fascinating thing once that I, I think is very valuable, where, where he said, you, you need to develop these habits before the storm. You know, it's great once the storm comes to develop good habits like meditation and exercise and eating healthily and having good relationships and the like. But he said, really, you want to develop the habit before the storm. And that's that's a very helpful, practical piece of advice for all of us as we're, we're, we're preparing for adversity. It sticks out to me, your stories about Bill Miller and him saying, no, when I'm stressed out, I drink alcohol mm. and eat Chinese food. And, yeah. um, yeah, so Scott and I are paid a lot of attention to our diets and exercise and our yeah. sort of mental condition. I think, you know, one of the things that, that kind of fleshes out of this discussion that's unique to investing, cause it's, you know, invest professional investors are a lot like professional athletes and the extent that they train, they focus, they put their whole life into it. But what differentiates the two uh, professions is. In, in investing, it's a mix of skill and circumstance. Mm. So the athletes, the investors with the greatest skill can have the circumstances move against them for, as you pointed out, William, 10, 12 years at an extreme. And that there is there are very few endeavors that you could get into where you have enormous skill and someone who doesn't know anything about the game at all will come out and beat you for years in a row. That doesn't happen in tennis and in any type of you know, pursuit except investing where a kid, a 13 year old kid with a Robin hood account could embarrass you in any given year. And so that's, what's unique to yeah. the investing game and, and dealing with that up here is it's, Very hard. it's taxing, especially when it drags on. The other thing about it, I think is, the, I mean, that's, that's one reason why it's a beautiful microcosm to study as a writer, because you it's, it includes so so many different assets of high aspects of high performance, right? You've got to get control over your mind, your body, your habits, your uh, your schedule, your information diet. But the other thing that makes it a really great microcosm to study, if you want to learn how to be a, a better performer in life, is that the investors have skin in the game, and so the stakes are high. And so, because mm -hmm. the stakes are high. It it requires a different level of rigor and thoughtfulness, I think, in the way you approach it. So, so it's not like a journalist like me coming in and saying, "Well, you know, here's here's how you have a more productive life. Here's how you deal with adversity." It's um, you know, or here's how you deal with with uncertainty or the fact that the future is unknowable. You have skin in the game, and the stakes, if you're wrong, are immense. And there's a there's a beautiful quote from Dr. Johnson, who wrote the the dictionary. He's one of the great British writers who talked about how the um, uh, the prospect of hanging concentrates the mind admirably. And I always think that the the prospect of losing money concentrates the mind admirably. It forces you to be a better thinker. And so this is one of the reasons why I figured out um, when I was writing my book that it's worth studying the great investors is because they're having to think better because otherwise they're in real trouble. There's a yeah. price to pay when you're wrong. And it's not your skin, it's other people's skin. Mm. And that's what Sir John referenced, you know, over time. I think he had a saying once that other people's money is sacred. It's a sacred trust that you've entered and you have to perform. And I, I really think he, you know, took that to the fullest extent. And that was part of the driving force but behind how serious he was about investing. I did a great episode with Chris Davis, and he was telling me that, you know, he studied theology, yeah. which is so yeah. interesting to me, and in that he saw investing as sort of a lowly profession. And Tom Gaynor said to him, stewardship is a biblical profession. Yeah, So absolutely. I thought that was really interesting. 
Chris was one of the reasons why why I wrote about Tom Gaynor at such length in my book, because I interviewed Chris several years ago, and he said, as we were walking to the elevator in his building, we'd had, we'd had a couple of really nice interviews. This is a long time ago, seven, eight years ago, I think. And he said, you know, you should spend more time with Tom Gaynor. And I'd already interviewed Tom Gaynor and written about him in a previous book, and I admired him. But he, he talked about the moral seriousness of Tom and the fact that Tom... Had, when when Chris had been thinking of going into seminary, and Tom had said, "No, no, no, this is this is not a low vocation. You're taking you're taking care of people's retirement money, their kids' uh, college savings. It's a, it's a sacred profession." That that was what led me to go and spend a couple of days with Tom and to write about him in my book. It was really inspired by Chris. I do think Tom is immensely admirable. Tom, for people who don't know, um, who also actually I have you know, on an upcoming episode of my podcast, he's um, the the CEO of Markel. And he's a good example of someone who's not only a very smart, rational investor, but a really good human being. And, and so when I'm thinking of the the great investors I know who are also great human beings who you actually would want to clone because you look at them and they have great relationships and like Tom would be very high on that list. He's an, he's an unusual figure. I mean, I'll give you an example of this with Tom where a, a year or so ago I was, I had to find a famous investor basically to interview privately at an event for a big investment firm where I'm a senior advisor and so this is kind of stressful, right? You're, you're having to get someone to come speak. There's nothing really in it for them at all. And, um, you know, I didn't want to fail and let down the people I, I was helping. And I emailed Tom and said, would you, would you consider doing an interview? And this is in the midst of COVID, right? So I was like, we could do it virtually or we could do it in person. And he writes back immediately. He's like, yeah, let's do it. And he's like, I'm, I'm happy to do it in person. It'll be much better energy in person. And... The next thing I know, he he takes a train for six hours from Virginia to come come do this fireside chat with me. He spent he came the night before for dinner um, with these people at this investment firm. It's a really wonderful event having that dinner with this great investor. And then the next morning he comes and I do this fireside chat, and he gets on the train and goes back to Virginia for six hours. And this is a guy with twenty thousand employees you know, running a Fortune 400 company, uh, probably $20 billion in assets he's managing as an investor there. And that's, that's an incredible example of how to have a life well lived, right? Because now I'm going to love Tom forever, right? I mean, Tom is such a, I, I actually, I signed up this morning myself and my wife for the Markel brunch in, in Omaha, because my wife's yeah, my wife's coming for the first time and, and I'm like, oh, she should come to the brunch as well. And so there's a reason why it's standing room only at that Markel brunch often, because it's not just because Tom is a small investor, it's because he's a decent human being. And so I think, I think again, this gets at a really important, really important point that when you're trying to learn from the greatest investors, look at what you really want to clone, look at what, um, what's most valuable to you and then really go big on it. Like, like you don't need to clone everything. You don't need to say, well, I'm going to live my life, you know, by Sir John's calendar and his exercise regimen. But you do want to say, okay, so what am I doing for my peace of mind? What, what, am, what am I doing for my physical fitness? What am I, how am I managing my time? What am I doing in terms of my relationships? Am I treating people selflessly? Do I have a sense of service in, in taking care of other people's money or their interests or or am I just out for myself? And so I I think I I think Chris Davis pointed at something really important when he talked about the uh, learning from Tom about the morality of this game. That there's a it's you know how Munger often quotes someone who said uh, everything is just one damn relatedness after another. It's all related. The way you manage your money. And the way you treat your family and your friends and the way you give away money, it's all related. There are these, there, there are these consistent themes that run through all of it. Yeah. You know, Prem Watsa would be a great person. Have you interviewed him? I never yeah. have. I, I really appreciate to. if you'd introduce me to him. I'd oh, love I'd to. Love uh, to. I'd He's love a to. great example of um, somebody who lives very aligned with his values and treats people the right way 
the culture at Fairfax is really remarkable. So Francis Chu, I, I've written yeah. about before, who has uh, obviously worked very closely with Prem Watson. And, and Francis, again, is a remarkable person who would... He, Francis is so idiosyncratic that he would, um, when he underperformed, he would just return his fees to his shareholders. And people would look at him and be like, what on earth are you doing? And he'd say, well, I, um, I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve those fees. Yeah. He's amazing? a really he's a really neat person. I, yeah. I I can't even mentally keep up with him. I yeah. did ask him to come on the podcast, and he was like, I, "I don't do any podcast. I don't know if that's true or not." But um, I, I run into him in Toronto yeah. when I'm up there. Um, really remarkable person. Yeah. yeah. So you've you've spent your career clearly interviewing the top money minds in the industry. Who really stands out to you? I mean, I'm anticipating you saying Warren Buffett. I've heard you talk to talk about Arnold Vandenberg, who is really living aligned with their values that you would like to emulate. Arnold, who just mentioned, I I wrote to yesterday, and I just I I, I, I realized that I kind of missed Arnold, and I just wanted to talk to him again. And I just wrote to him and uh, arranged to chat with him next week, and um, and to get him on my podcast again because. He's just such an extraordinary role model, not not just as an investor, but much more for how to live. And he's someone I, I write about him at length in the epilogue of the book. And I end the book with him because what I'm what I'm trying to explain there is really that if you're trying to understand what a truly successful and truly abundant life is, there's nobody you want to learn from more than Arnold. And and I think part of it is that he was dealt such a terrible hand in life. He, this is a guy, for people who don't know, who whose parents were in Auschwitz. He was born on the street in Amsterdam that Anne Frank was born on, where she was in hiding. And he spent the first couple of years of his life in hiding before his parents were taken to Auschwitz. And then he was hidden in an orphanage as a child. And so he was basically starved in this orphanage because they just didn't have enough food. And so by the end of the war, when his parents miraculously survived Auschwitz and came to pick him up, they couldn't even recognize him because he was so emaciated and he, he, he couldn't walk, basically. He would shuffle along on his knees. And so years later, he was struggling even to get through high school, uh, never went to college. And he said to his, uh, well, he, he overhears a conversation that his mother was having with a psychologist because they were worried that he was, you know, um, not doing well at school and wasn't working out well. He overheard them basically saying, uh, well, maybe he has mental damage from being malnourished as a child at a very key point in his development. And so he grew up thinking he was stupid, full of rage against the Germans with a sense of anger and rage. And his parents were terrible to him in many ways. I mean, his father used to hit him. And his mother was tough and difficult and would spray him and his friends with, with a hose. I mean, it was, you know, he had a tough child. And then he gets married and to his high school sweetheart who runs off with another man. I mean, so he started with the worst possible hand. And then you see him now. And he's just this loving, kind, generous, decent, happy human being. And so the the transformation, this is this is what I was trying to write about in the book was, and, and this in many ways is an extension of what I was writing about with Sir John, that what Arnold did is he took control of his inner landscape and he did it in very different ways. I mean, he, he, he used to hypnotize himself. Um, mm -hmm. He's talked a lot about that and hypnotizing yeah, the son. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you see his relationship with his son, Scott, who's president of, of Arnold's investment firm. And it's just a really beautiful thing to behold. I mean, you, you see the love that his son has for him. And what's even more beautiful is actually Scott, Scott the son, is from um, his mother's first marriage. And so Arnold take, takes, takes this, this adopted kid and loves him in such an unbelievable way. And I, I remember being in Arnold's office in Austin, and he's, he's talking about how he trained Scott this adopted son to be an athlete. And he was this little kid who wasn't a good athlete. 
and he trains them and he trains them through hypnosis and and they you know they they did shot put together and his son ends up becoming this champion athlete and Arnold is showing me these old newspaper articles that he had f- about Scott's sporting achievements and he starts to tear up and I said um how come it makes you so emotional and he says well you know I remember what a vulnerable little kid he was, you know, like this little weak kid and like the, the fact that he did this and just the sense of the sense of pride and delight that he took in somebody else's transformation. And, the, and you know, Scott, Scott once said to me, I'm the only kid I ever met who was tucked in by his father when he was 18 every night because his father used to come uh, in and hypnotize in. him before he went to bed <laughs> so that, you know, he could change his mindset. And, so there's something really beautiful about that, the, 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 the kindness, the sense of compassion that Arnold has. And then I, I realized at a certain point I had this revelation a few months ago. It's such an obvious revelation, but I was, I was walking along one day and I realized, well, Arnold had this extraordinary um, second marriage to a woman called Eileen, who he's been with for more than 50 years. And she's such a warm, loving, kind person. And I realized that really... Part of the story, yes, part of the story was transforming his own mind with things like mantras and, and hypnosis and prayers and things like that. And part of it was just the love of a really good human being who who transformed his life. And and that's kind of a beautiful and humbling thought again, that that some you can you can just get lucky and someone comes into your life and treats you with incredible love and compassion. And it's sort of, I I remember a friend of mine once talking about a situation and saying, yeah, you just have to melt them with love. Um, And I could see this friend of mine doing that with people. He would just melt people with love. He's a very loving, kind human being, which is odd because he previously worked at Goldman Sachs. Uh, (laughs) uh, (laughs) That is odd. (laughs) uh, Yeah, but he became a spiritual teacher. And so I I, I think that all of this stuff, when you look at Arnold's life, it points you towards certain lessons where you think, okay, so I've got to get control over my inner landscape, but also there has to be an element of sharing to have a truly abundant life. And so when I look at Arnold, one of the things that I admire most about him is he's constantly looking to help people. So there was, I, I interviewed a, a well-known investor a week or so ago who was telling me that she has a child who was sick. And so the very first thing I and she she had had she'd been impacted by the interview that I'd done with Arnold on my podcast where he'd been talking about mindset, and so her child was using various mantras and the like um, to to heal himself. And I I wrote to her and I said, you know, would you like me to introduce you to Arnold? And and I wrote to Arnold the other day and I said, you know, I think you could have a big impact on this child. And there's just an assumption that you have that Arnold will want to help. Mm-hmm. this kid that he doesn't know. And that's a that's a very beautiful thing, right? How many people do we know in our lives who you can who you know are very successful, very busy, and yet you're like, yeah, they would drop everything and help the kid. For sure. I talked to Arnold yesterday on the phone. He's coming on the vodcast. Oh, and lovely. the first the first time I met Arnold, he was in Toronto and I don't know how old he is, but he's older. Yeah, about eighty two probably. Eighty two, eighty three. Yeah. And uh, as somebody was like, yeah, I was just meeting with Arnold in his hotel room. He was doing some yoga and we were, you know, meditating. And I was like, who is this man? I've yeah. got to meet Arnold yeah. Vandenberg. And he has been a delight to know yeah. throughout the years. And he takes everything so seriously. So I asked him to come on the podcast a long time ago and he said he would. Yeah. But now we've had to correspond so yeah. much because he wants to get it right for yeah. me. Yeah. He's like, I know this is really important to you. You know, I just want to, I want to get it right for you. And I'm like, oh, you're going to be great no matter what. Like, don't worry about it. No, he's a wonderful role model. I I had a very interesting, similar experience to that with a very different type of human being, but recently where I interviewed Ray Dalio on my podcast and he arranged a pre-interview the day before to spend half an hour talking before the interview. And I thought that's really interesting. Here you have this guy who I think is like, the 36th richest man in America, you know, 19, 20 billion dollars, something like that. And not only is he going to come on for an hour and a half, two hours, or whatever, or on the day of the interview, but he wanted to prepare for it. Sure. Yeah. I thought that was very interesting. It tells you something about the commitment to excellence 
of these people operating at a very high level. Because I, I mean, I literally, I, you know, I, 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 five minutes before our interview, I like get out of the shower, I like put the microphone in, and I'm just, you know, like Sir John would be looking at me and be like, "Time management, look at you, you schmuck." You know? Yeah. Um, but. Um, you know, yeah, here's Dalio, who's way busier and way more important. And here's Arnold actually preparing really seriously. And seriously. it tells you something. Yeah. It tells you something about the commitment to excellence. Scott, who does that remind you of from the Templeton touch? Which money manager that prepared and studied his chapter? Mason Hawkins. Yeah. That's Mason. interesting. Mason Hawkins. Mason Hawkins very is thorough, exactly very the same prepared. way. Yeah. Shocking. It's that total alignment that you were talking about, William. This is yeah. how they handle investments. It's how they yeah. handle probably just about every aspect of their life. Yeah, it's true. And he was very influenced. I remember him telling me, Mason Hawkins, how influenced he had been by going out to meet Sir John early in his career. And that a lot of that sense of Mason Hawkins' firm being being built on the principle of giving to others, the amount of the amount of charitable work they've done in places like Memphis, I think, for people f- from underprivileged backgrounds, that was very much inspired by Sir John. And and so I think when you see people, when you see people operating at at a high moral and ethical level, it's very inspiring. And and so yeah, I, it, it, I mean, it's interesting that all these years after Sir John has gone, we're still talking about him. He still had that impact on Mason Hawkins. Likewise, I, I mean, I tell you a beautiful example of this with with Arnold, that when Arnold was a teenager, he he was a very good salesman, and his father wouldn't let him have any money; he had to support himself. And so, from the age of thirteen, I think he was more or less responsible for paying for his own clothes and food, and he wanted to buy a car, and so he gets this job selling flowers, and he gets an unbelievable. He, he does unbelievably well, and they give him the best spot on the street. And and so he's going to make hay this time. And then there's this kind of biblical storm, and he gets utterly drenched. And a total stranger pulls up in her car and opens the window and says, you know, you need to get out of this rain. And he's like, well, I can't. I've got to sell these flowers. And she said, well, how much are they? And he says, well, you know, these are a dollar or whatever for this and whatever. And she's like, no, for all of them. And she buys all of the flowers and then drives him to her home and gives him, I think, one of her husband's sweaters or shirts or something like that so that he'll be dry and gives him a bowl of soup. And, and it was, he, he, said, he said to me, I, I've talked to him about this story a bunch of times. And the first time he said, you know, when someone touches your heart like that, it changes you forever. And years later, I was talking to him about it again. And he said, it, she was Christian. And she said, it was the first time that someone who wasn't Jewish had done something kind for me, you know. So, so here was a guy who'd come through the Holocaust, and actually he'd been hidden by by Christians who'd hidden him in a Christian orphanage, but at an age when he wasn't so conscious of that. Saved by a teenage girl, right? Exactly. Yeah. He was also from a devoutly Christian family, <laughs> but I think there was something about this woman helping him at the age of sixteen, the 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 when he was sixteen, and being like, wait, somebody, a total stranger. This Christian takes me into her house, buys all my flowers, and and I remember many years he 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 forgot this uh, that he had told me this, but years later I reminded him that he he'd gone into I think some store where they were fixing his hearing aid or he was getting a battery for his hearing aid or something like that, and there was a girl in the queue in front of him or behind him, and he hears that she's going to be leaving Texas for the first time ever to go I think to her brother or her cousin's graduation from the Marines or something like that. And he says, I'd like to give you this so you could take out your cousin or your brother or whoever it was. And he gives her a hundred dollar bill. And she said, no, I can't possibly take that. And he's like, no, no, no. Uh, Like it's a gift for me to give it to you. And he tells her the story of this woman helping him all those years before. And so, and and it was interesting. It was revealing that he couldn't remember that he'd had, he'd given a hundred dollars to this woman in the, in the queue when I mentioned it to him years later. But so there you have an act of someone 65, 67 years earlier helping him. And it reverberates down all these decades later, influencing the way he behaves with others. And now as we watch the way Arnold behaves, it influences the way we behave and makes us want to be better people. So long after Arnold is gone, hopefully like 
our children and your children will behave better because of things they read or heard about what Arnold did. And so again, it points you towards this sense of what you actually want to learn from these people. It's like, yeah, you want to learn how to get rich, uh, but not even really for the money. You know, what, 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 Arnold, what Arnold said to me is, look, once I got to a point where I had like $250,000, I was kind of done. He's like, then I knew that I wasn't going to have to work for any kind of idiot um, and, and take any, any nonsense from anyone. And, and, you know, you got a small home that wasn't, you know, flash or anything. He didn't want a flash car. And as he got richer, really what it did was it enabled him to help other people. And so, I, yeah, so the, the, money, the money was valuable in terms of peace of mind. It was valuable because it meant that he didn't have to worry about the next bill, the next, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. It wasn't because he was going to live in a super fancy way, but it's given him the time to help other people and the money to help other people. And so, again, it's like, I, I want to learn from Arnold about the importance of changing my inner landscape. And I want to learn from Arnold about the importance of becoming more sharing, uh, because then it makes sense that Arnold said to me, I'm the richest man in the world. Because yeah, it's, it's I love not, that. yeah, it's not about money. It's, it's, it's that he has peace of mind. And I think self-respect as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I admire him so much too. Well, we have been recording for a long time and I have enjoyed this. We could go on and on. I do have a few questions. Ah, sure. So I'll put this out to our podcast followers right before, about two hours before we came on. So I'm just going to pass along these questions. So Paul Williams for from LinkedIn wants me to ask you that he believes you hold a handful of index funds and a few small positions and equities that you have picked yourself. And he would like for me to ask you why you haven't adopted cloning some of the investors hmm. you're so close to. I, I have over the, I mean, well, first of all, what I would say is I wouldn't necessarily follow me as a great investor. I'm a much better writer than I am <laughs> an investor. Um, but so I'm trying to convey truths and principles from the investors I, I've written about. But so indexing is very, very powerful, very difficult to be an index fund. And I write about um, people like Joel Greenblatt and Howard Marks talking about the power of indexing. Also, Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, uh, who I interviewed many years ago, talking about the difficulty of beating index funds. I think there's a very good argument for having some of your money indexed. How, Howard Marks once said, you know, most people should have most of their money indexed. So I, for many years, have indexed my wife's money and my kids' money because I don't feel like they should suffer for my delusions that I can beat the market. And and I think it's a pretty good default position. I, what I've always done, which hopefully is directionally correct, but I'm not telling anyone they should do this themselves, is you can buy something like the Vanguard Total stock market index fund and the Vanguard total international markets index fund. And I would just, I, I, for more than 20 years, basically just, I, I would have 50, 50 more or less in those two, because I was trying to remind myself, I don't, I don't want to just assume that because the U S has been good, it'll continue to be good. So I right. wanted to diversify internationally, even when it wasn't paying off. And I think that's a pretty good default position then just to keep adding to that pot. But then I also, over the years, I've met so many good investors and I have a tendency to sort of fall in love with people that I'm interviewing. And so, so then over the years, I've, I've occasionally bought funds, invested in funds run by people I like and admire. So I, I own two actively managed hedge funds that are run by people I'm close to um, and who, who are both honorable. And, and I think one of the things that's, that's key that I do think is, 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 a, is a valuable insight is um, there, there's, there's just very obvious alignment between their interests and mine. And, and when you look at the fee structure of the people you invest with, you just want to make sure you can see they're not just making money off you, they're making money with you. And likewise, I, I own, you know, one of the three individual stocks I own is, um, is Berkshire, which I just regard as a long term holding. Because again, there's no annual management fee. You have the float. You have these two brilliant old buffers paying themselves $100,000 a year to manage an enormous, enormous business. And they're making money with you, not off you. And 
they're trying to survive, right? They're not, they're not trying to just hit the ball out of the park. They want to make sure that they stay in the game and that they enable their shareholders to stay in the game. And, and so for me, part of the, so if you think about what I learned from Sir John, right, about a regular investor should own five or six funds that give you exposure to different areas of the market, I have two index funds, two hedge funds, one, one other mutual fund. So that's five funds and then Berkshire, which is kind of a fund in a way. So in, in some ways, every time I decide that I'm going to do something different, I kind of think, well, no, Sir John was probably right about that. And that's my default. Well, that's a really sound advice. Um, Pavel Kasanov wants to know if you were on a deserted island for 10 years with just one book, which one would it be? Oh, gosh. I mean, the, the, the book that I kind of dip into every day that I have on my desk here is this very strange, mysterious old book in Aramaic called the Zohar. Zohar means um, Book of Splendor. Uh, so, and so this is a strange book and it's, it's literally, it's written in Aramaic, but, but then translated into English. And I, I dip into that every day and I, I, that's a very beautiful and mystifying book. So I definitely want that, but, but I, but I'm not sure. I mean, that would be good for me spiritually, but what about intellectually and in terms of entertainment value, which if I were on a desert island, I'd be going nuts. So I, I would probably, I would probably want like the some, something reasonably edifying, like the complete works of Shakespeare or something like that. Cause I'd be like, wow, finally I have, you know, I read all of Shakespeare's plays when I was at college, but, um, I would, uh, I think there were about 36 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I would have time to go back and actually study them, but you know, something like in search of lost time by Proust, which I got, I got f f to 400 pages before the end of this 4,000 word book. And then I got distracted. I meant to finish it on my 40th birthday and then started reading it. And so I went to Deauville in France where he wrote some of the book. I was, I was going to finish it on my 40th birthday and um, in, in that site. And then I got distracted and started reading a, a really great Philip Roth novel. And I've never read that final 400 pages. Oh, and now, of course, no. I can't remember what the earlier parts were really about. So, so maybe I should take in search of lost time. So at least I'd be able to, uh, to read something edifying and yeah. finally finish the book on the island. Well, we'll put, um, put those books in the show notes. Eric Thiessen wants to know, have you started to write another book? No, I, I keep, I keep gathering string for ideas for books, but I'm, I'm not in a real hurry to do it yet. It's, um, you know, I, cause I also, I also ghost write. So I've, I wrote something like five books in seven years. And I'm just tired. It's really hard. It's really painful. And, and Richard Wiser Happier took five years and I didn't take a day off, basically. I mean, I, I don't work on Saturdays, but I work many Sundays and I didn't take a vacation in five years. And so there is an element of me just being kind of tired. And also, I think a lot of people, a lot of writers churn stuff out as if they have a lot of really good ideas and uh, you know, they'll turn out a new book every couple of years. And it's like, I don't, I don't have that many ideas. I mean, I'm gathering string. I'm working on things, thinking through things, you know, that book in some ways was a synthesis of stuff that I'd learned over 25 years. And, and so I had a lot to say and I, I don't want to hurry into doing another one. And, and in some ways, the podcast, so, so the Richard Wise Happier podcast is really a spin-off of the book. It takes the most fun parts of being a journalist, which are basically doing the research and then doing the interviews and then synthesizing it and figuring out what to learn from it. And it leaves the most painful part, which is sitting on your own in your study and quietly smashing your head against the computer and being like, <laughs> will they ever read what I've written? And what if it's terrible? And it's, I, the writing is a painful, painful thing for me. But very joyful when you're done. <laughs> you now so, have a podcast, so yeah, that's exactly. a much simpler format. Could you please tell our listeners where they can go to sure. listen to your podcast? How can they order your book? Um, how can they go to follow you? Sure, thank you. So the podcast is called Richer, Wiser, Happier, and it, it goes out on the feed of We Study Billionaires, which was set up by the Investors Podcast Network by my friend Stig Broderson. And it's th thanks to Stig and Preston Pierce, who founded the Investors Podcast Network, it reaches an amazing audience, um, very large audience. And so it gives me an opportunity to have these long, in-depth conversations with amazing people like Ray Dalio or Bill Miller or Howard Marks or, you know, Manish Parabrice, amazing people. And so 
uh, and then some. I slip in a few unexpected people who, uh, you know, like uh, like interviewed this uh, this guy I revere called Sokni Rinpoche, who's a, a great Tibetan Buddhist Lama. And I did an episode with him and Daniel Goleman, who I'm friends with, who wrote the stuff on emotional intelligence. And is very brilliant. And, and is also a student of Sokni's and co-wrote a book with him. And so so it, it just gives you an, a, an opportunity to have deep, in-depth conversations. So that's really fun. And then in terms of the book, you know, you find it on Amazon. You can find it in any local bookstore. And it's... Um, uh, and I, I, I hope you find it helpful. I, I, and buy many copies. You'll become yeah. that much richer and wiser and happier. Yes, you can give them to your family and friends. <laughs> exactly. I gave them to my family for Christmas one year, and everyone really appreciated it. Ah, so it is, it is worth it. There were a few more questions we didn't get to, so maybe check them out on Twitter, and maybe you can reply directly to sure. listeners there. We appreciate your time, William. And it has been a delight to have you uh, on the podcast. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I, I really admire uh, all of the work that you've done over the years, not only with the podcast, but with your, your Google talk and also, which was excellent, but also with Thank your you. books, which were a sort of, they, they, they were, they were a serious part of my research on Sir John. You know, I really, I really used your books carefully then I had, you know, my day of interviews with him, plus another interview that I'd done with him. But it was, I, 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 I really used the work you, you'd done, and it was very, it was very thoughtful and well written and well put together. So, so. Well, thank I, you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Investing the Templeton Way. Please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. To view the show notes and resources mentioned in today's show. Head to investingthetempletonway.com.